this session we are going to touch a bit about Ajax and how to initiate Ajax communications using AngularJS. This is just going to be a beginning point of Ajax and we are not going to cover all the Ajax topics as part of this video. Those will be covered eventually as part of my coming up videos. And in order to work with Ajax, we are also going to develop a couple of web services using ASP.NET Web API and also Node.js. However, the scope of discussion will be just limited to AngularJS. Also, as part of this video, I am going to introduce $HTTP and $Log services available as part of AngularJS. Okay, so first of all, let us see what exactly is Ajax here. Imagine I have a server, so that is a web server, which is serving website or a web service. And now, Imagine I'm having a browser, so which means obviously I'm going to try to access any kind of web page available from the website, I mean available in the website through web browser. So in this case, browser becomes the client and our web server becomes the server. So the first thing is that the request is going to be initiated from the browser to the server. So which means we may be typing just an URL like www.google.com or yahoo.com or your particular website.com. So the moment we type the URL, the request actually goes to the server. So the first thing is that we are going to have first request to the website in the form of URL. And again, that particular request is going to be from the browser to the server. So on top of that, Whenever we are actually requesting the first request, usually you are requesting for a HTML page or an ASPX page or PHP page based on the server side technologies you are implementing. So imagine if it is an HTML page, so which means you are trying to have a particular HTML page to be retrieved from the server back to the browser or say back to the client. So similarly, if it is any server side technology like ASPX or PHP, those particular pages will be interpreted or executed at the server level and the resultant HTML will be returned back to the browser. Okay, so once the request has been initiated, then we are going to have a particular response to be returned from the server. And yes, this is going to be the response for the first request from the browser. Usually, that particular response, whatever we are going to receive from the server to the browser, is in the form of full page. So whenever I say full page, it essentially contains the HTML element, which is nothing but the root element, the body, and so on. And it will contain all the HTML, CSS links, and JavaScripts, and all the necessary references of the JavaScript files, or CSS files, or any other CDN, hrefs, or whatever. So all those particular files will be referred as part of the same HTML and at the same time you are going to receive the HTML root element and also the body element and so on. So this is the first response with respect to our first request which will be initiated from the browser to the server. And as I mentioned the resultant or the response whatever the browser is going to receive is just nothing but HTML, CSS and JavaScript. You are going to have HTML and the body, all of those particular tags at the very top. And imagine we are having a subsequent request from the browser to the server. So which means we are already working on the same web page and from the same web page I am having one more request to the same website. So this is going to be say something like second request and it is from the same website and to the same web server. Usually these kind of requests will be triggered as part of user interactions like button click or submit or something of that sort like if you have selected any kind of element inside the drop down list or whatever. So that is part of user interaction. So all the subsequent requests usually will be some kind of user interaction from an existing web page which has been already rendered as part of the client or say browser. Now how does the server respond back to the browser? So essentially there are two different ways on how the server can respond from all the subsequent requests apart from the first request. And this is a big one. So the first thing is that this is always going to be new response and that particular new response again even though it is a new response it is from the same website 
that is pretty important so you are getting the response from the same website as because you are actually sending the request to the same website anyway and the next thing is that you have two types of responses so it could be any of another full page response or a partial response so whatever the response you are going to receive from the second request onwards will be falling into either of these two categories the first one is full page response which means again it contains all new HTML body tags and so on and it again contains all the HTML CSS and JS references so which means the new response whatever you are going to receive will have new HTML new body tags and all the new references of CSS and JavaScript and if you happen to receive that kind of response from any of the subsequent requests after the first request then you can say actually you are receiving a full page response as part of the re uh, subsequent request but imagine you are not really having a full page response but your particular response somehow falls into these particular categories like first of all it does not contain HTML and body tags it can contain other HTML elements like div or table or span or whatever but not a full-blown HTML document like starting with HTML or body but it can contain some parts of HTML elements if necessary and if you happen to receive those particular parts of HTML tags like divs or tables without really receiving the whole HTML or body those particular tags will be actually injected or replaced as part of existing web page which is already being seen by the user so which means the user might be already seeing a complete web page and upon click if you happen to receive one more div that particular div will be somewhat replaced but are injected into existing web page and the user sees the new content which means the whole page will not be refreshed however certain parts of the web page gets new content or say gets refreshed so it is only certain parts but not the full blown page if it is full blown page it is like full page response if it is parts of the page then we can say it is partial response and this particular partial response doesn't necessarily just contain only the HTML elements it can also contain just the JSON or XML or data representation so which means this response sometimes can just have JavaScript object or just XML or just some primitive values like 30 or 40 or some string like uh, or CT string like Vienna or Austin or something of that sort so you can see what you are actually retrieving or whatever the response you were receiving from the server to the browser can be a full-blown HTML document or just some parts of the HTML or just a JavaScript object or XML or some kind of data if you happen to receive JSON or uh, I mean JavaScript object or XML or data usually you will be having certain kind of JavaScript which will be executed at the browser the browser level which essentially tries to parse that particular information whatever you receive from the server and after parsing that particular data whatever it has passed will be injected or will be placed into the existing HTML elements which are already available as part of the web page or rendered as part of the web page like if you have text boxes or any kind of drop downs or whatever whatever the information you must have received using XML or data that information you would like to put inside a text box or a drop down or any kind of div or whatever so still you are actually working with some existing elements on the browser and trying to replace with some new data whatever you must have received from the server so again going back you have two types of responses the first one is full page response where it will be having full blown HTML document to be received from the server the second one is either you can have some HTML elements which could be replaced as part of our existing web page or you can just work with the JSON or XML or data whatever you are going to receive from the server and push that information into any of the existing HTML elements which includes all the input elements as well so this is pretty big as part of the response from the subsequent request usually and whenever you have this kind of response like a full page response usually you will be calling that one as full page postback 
and again as I mentioned full page post back usually means you will be posting some information to the server and you will be expecting a full blown HTML document as part of the response that is full page post back and if you have any of the response in any of these types like parts of HTML or JSON or whatever, you are going to call that one as partial page post back. So whenever I say partial page post back, you are not going to receive whole web page, but you might be receiving some data or some parts of that particular web page where that information will be replaced as part of existing content. So that is the reason it is called as partial page. And whenever I say post back, which means you might be submitting some information to the server prior to getting the response. And that is the reason I call that one as post back. <clears throat> and usually any of the partial page oriented post backs or partial page responses is going to happen through a technology called Ajax. So whenever I talk about Ajax, essentially I'm talking about partial page post backs or partial page responses. So whenever I talk about Ajax, just imagine we are talking about partial response from the server, but not a full blown or full page response. So whenever I say partial page, you are talking about Ajax. And Ajax stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So again, you can see it works with JavaScript and in return it might have XML or JavaScript or JSON or data, whatever, and everything happens asynchronously. Okay, let us switch to the next slide. So let us recap everything whatever we learned as part of Ajax and bit more to have a better understanding about Ajax here. What is Ajax? It is nothing but a special type of communication which happens between the browser and the server without having a full page response. So it is still a network activity. So a network activity which happens between the browser and the server. And again, whenever this particular network activity or the communication which is going to happen, uh, the response of that is not going to be a full page, but it is going to be a partial page response. So that is what we'll call it as Ajax. And next, usually those kind of Ajax based communications or partial page requests and responses are going to be achieved only through JavaScript. Users can still interact with the UI while the communication happens behind the scenes. So this is important. If it is a full page request or full page post back, usually the user will not be able to have any kind of operations to be done against existing user interface on the web page. So which means while the request has passed through the server, the user has to sit idle till the response comes back from the server for a full page response. But if it is a partial page response, the user doesn't need to wait for that particular response while it is being processed at the server. The user can still interact with existing user interface, whatever is already available as part of the web page on the browser. So that is how it is called as asynchronous. So asynchronous means the user does not need to wait for any kind of re response from the, u from the server. So during this particular asynchronous operations, it is a common practice to actually show a spinner while it is doing some kind of server based processing. So this is a common practice like whenever you see a spinner, you can see that it is an Ajax based request and some kind of process is being done at the server level. And once the process has been completed by the server, after the response, that is the partial page response has been received by the client, then we are going to have that one to be rendered as part of the web page. So this is an usual practice. The next one, the Ajax response, response, whatever I mentioned earlier, the partial page response or Ajax response from now onwards can always be returning either JSON or XML or data or even HTML. So whenever I call data, essentially those are nothing but primitive values or sometimes it could be some binary information as well. If the response is HTML, this is already covered earlier. If the response is some kind of HTML element, but not the full blown HTML tags or body, that data or that particular HTML elements or those elements or whatever you're going to receive from the server will be injected or replaced as part of existing elements or to the DOM as part of the same response. Next, if the response is in the form of JSON or XML or data, we are going to pass that response and place the 
those values or data into the respective parts of HTML, which includes input elements. So now that we understood something about AJAX, let us see how all of this can be used as part of AngularJS. And prior to jumping into AngularJS, I would like to note about a concept called cores, C-O-R-S. This course is something we'll have to know before even jumping into AngularJS. I'm not going to cover the entire topic of course, but we need to have some understanding about what it is. So imagine I have a server and it is hosting some domain like domain one. So whenever I say domain, it could be Google or Yahoo or whatever. Imagine it is domain one and it is serving the website for the domain one and it might even have a web service for domain one. And now I have a client. And once a request has been made, now you can see this particular web page is actually coming from domain one. So the browser has the current web page which has been served by the web server serving at domain one. So I am literally seeing the domain one web page right now. Imagine. So what does it mean? So web page comes from domain one. So whatever the web page you are seeing here is coming from domain one server here. And if there are any Ajax based operations, all that Ajax happens from the same web page to domain one. So if you are communicating using some Ajax here, all those requests are being carried from the same web page of domain one to the same server which is from the domain one. So if such is the case, there are no restrictions as part of such kind of communications. So which means all those communications can happen with no problems. Why? Because you are working with the same domain and you are working from the same web page which has been served from web domain that is domain one. So as long as you are working with the same domains, you will not have any problems towards any kind of communications or restrictions towards the communications. But imagine now I am having one more server which is actually serving domain two. So, but still I am seeing the web page from domain one. However, imagine there exists some kind of JavaScript which is trying to interact with domain two. So which means I am having some kind of Ajax operation which is supposed to happen from the web page to domain one, but instead it is happening from the domain one to domain two, which means I am trying to communicate through Ajax that is also from the browser, which is serving web page from domain one, but the communication of Ajax happening towards domain two, and that is usually restricted. So that is called cross-site origin. So cross-origin resource sharing, that is cross. So cross-origin, which means this is the origin from where the web page has been served. However, you are trying to access the information from somewhere else. So which means you are crossing this origin to somewhere else, and that is usually restricted. So make sure that whenever you are trying to have any kind of Ajax operations, which are being done from one domain to another domain, you have some restrictions applied. And again, whenever I say domain one and domain two, those those doesn't necessarily be just the domains. Those include just the port numbers as well. Like imagine I'm having some website.com as domain one, but some website serving port number 4040 from domain two is also considered as domain two. So even though the same website or the domain name is same, if you have a difference in port numbers, then again that is treated as domain 2, which means you are not having the same information from domain 1. If the port numbers change or if the domains change, you are essentially working with two different domains from the browser's perspective. Okay. Now, this is the uh, you know, understanding about how that restriction usually is carried upon. The Ajax happens from domain one web page. You can see this web page is fro served from domain one. And Ajax is happening from domain one web page. And Ajax is trying to access our resource, access resource or data from domain two. So this Ajax information or Ajax based communication is happening, initiated from domain one, but trying to carry or trying trying to access some information domain two. And that is what is called as 
cross origin or domain resource sharing so you are trying to share a resource from some other domain from which you are not actually using the same domain from which the web page has been rendered and that is called cross cross origin resource sharing and it is restricted by default by all the browsers but imagine I really want this one to happen which means I do not want any restrictions to happen here or to be applied here but still I would like to have this whole diagram to be working fine with no problems then you need to have this particular domain too to say something like it has to be enabled with course so whatever the development you are going to do as part of this particular server has to be mentioned exclusively saying that this domain can share the information from for any domain so domain 2 can take any request from any domain so that is what is called as enable course that needs to be applied from the server side scripting and it is not part of AngularJS though so it is going to be part of whoever is going to develop this web service so this is pretty much about course so in simple words if you would like to access the domain 2 information from any domain then you need to enable the course and once the, the enable or once the course has been enabled from domain 2 then any browser from rendering any web page from any domain can access the information from domain 2 so this is pretty much about course and we are going to see how course could be enabled using ASP.NET Web API or Node.js as part of this video itself and next how do we achieve Ajax using AngularJS so which means how do we communicate to the server as I mentioned Ajax is a network activity it is not just going to happen at the client side you are actually going to communicate with the server call some request or call some method and the server will be responding back with some information or response so Ajax is a network activity which happens from the browser to the server so how can I achieve it using AngularJS there are couple of ways in order to communicate with server as part of AngularJS the first one is using dollar HTTP we might be already familiar with uh, dollar scope or dollar root scope or so on similarly you have one more service called dollar HTTP so this is a built-in angular service so whenever you see dollar symbol with a particular variable something you can say that is a built-in angular service so we are going to cover services a bit later but just consider dollar http is a built-in angular service which can be used by any of the controllers which are available as part of your particular angular application and if you'd like to have ajax to be implemented dollar http is the recommended way moving forward if you are not really using it so if you are developing an AngularJS application from the scratch it is always recommended to use $HTTP as because AngularJS already knows what it is $HTTP and it is built in and it is right inside the skeleton of AngularJS framework the next one is using jQuery Ajax so AngularJS behind the scenes already works with jQuery Lite version but on top of that imagine your particular web page is already having jQuery library uh, referred then you might be using jQuery as well and we do not have I mean AngularJS does not have any kind of problems with that one so which means if you are already having a reference to jQuery and if you feel you are more comfortable with jQuery there is nothing which can stop you from doing it so just a quick mentioning that if you are not falling into this category still I will be leaning towards dollar HTTP as because it will be serving as a backward compatible uh, code for future versions of AngularJS if you really want to but again if you would like to use jQuery based Ajax and if you are familiar with that you can still go ahead with whatever the knowledge you might have so apart from these two options if you would like to work with any other third party JavaScript li library which supports Ajax or if you would like to build an Ajax library on its own all of those are supported by AngularJS so AngularJS has got no restrictions on how you would like to communicate with the server using Ajax so it provides $HTTP by default if you would like to use it you can use it or if you are familiar with jQuery Ajax you can still use it but if you would like to have any other third party JavaScript library including on your own still you are free to use it and next again 
the server. So in order to communicate with the server, which means AngularJS will be sitting at the client that is at the browser. The AngularJS application, all it does is it tries to communicate with server during AJAX communications. So whenever I say server, usually it will be called as a web service or REST service. So using AngularJS, you always try to fetch the data, but not really fetch the HTML. This, this is very important. So using AngularJS, most of the time you try to fetch data instead of fetching the HTML. There could be a couple of scenarios where you might be trying to fetch HTML, but that is again depending on your requirements of your application. But usually AngularJS along with Ajax, most of the time you will be using with a web service or a REST service which happens to serve the data in the form of JSON or XML to your particular browser. And in order to develop that kind of web service, you can use any kind of technology in order to develop a web service using any kind of server-side technology like WCF REST or ASP.NET Web API or Node.js or PHP or any Java-based web service technologies you might have. And one important thing is that any of those web services or REST services usually will be returning the data in the form of JSON or XML. Okay, so this is pretty much about how you would like to communicate from AngularJS that is sitting at the client to the server. So you have a $HTTP which will be covered as part of this particular uh, session. And for the server, we are going to develop a web service from the scratch using ASP.NET Web API and also Node.js and test my particular AngularJS application with both of, both of these two applications. So let us quickly see how this particular dollar HTTP is going to work for us. First of all, as I mentioned, dollar HTTP is a built-in web built-in service which is available as part of AngularJS, and a typical dollar HTTP statement will be looking something like this. So, which means it starts with dollar HTTP, and in order to use dollar HTTP, you have to send certain kinds of options here. So all of these options, whatever you are going to provide, will be used in order to communicate or in order to work with the server. So the network communication happens based on the options, whatever you are going to provide here. And those options would include the URL to which server it needs to connect, and the HTTP method like get, post, put, delete, or whatever. And if you have any, if you have any headers, other HTTP headers, you might even want to send even those as well. So all of these are optional, but at least we should have the URL to be provided in order to have some kind of uh, Ajax operation to be provided. Without providing the URL, AngularJS doesn't know to which server it needs to get connected to. So this is pretty important. And on top of that, now we have then. Inside the then, we have two functions. So again, those two functions are optional, but let us see what is the first function. So this is called as a success function. So success function means you are going to initiate an AJAX operation using $HTTP. If that AJAX communication is successful, then this is the function which gets executed. If it is not, success, it is not successful, which means if it is a failure, then this particular function is going to be executed. So essentially you have two functions. The first function gets executed if the AJAX communication is successful. The second function gets executed if the AJAX communication is failed. So again, whenever it is successful, all the successful information will be placed as part of this particular object called response. You can put any object, R or O, whatever. But it is a general practice to put something like response so that it is quite read friendly. And similarly, even here as well, it is like, you know, a response which contains all the failure information on why it has failed. So this is a pretty simple dollar HTTP request for which we are going to cover as part of this video. But eventually, we are going to have more and more HTTP related information or dollar HTTP and AJAX based, um, what is explanations to be uh, explained. But here in this case, we are going to just favor only this kind of syntax at the moment. So all the options in order to connect or work with Ajax, work with 
the success function and work with failure function. Okay, let us jump into our code. So let me copy whatever I had as part of my previous video. So let me duplicate it. And in this case, I would like to call this one as T01 for now. And I would like to even duplicate the T02. Uh, let me call it as T01 as well. Okay, now you have T01 HTML and T01 JavaScript as well. So I have T01 JavaScript and T01 HTML. So let me put this side by side. And T01 has to work with T01JS. So you can see. I'm making sure that my particular HTML works with this particular JavaScript. So this is uh, the previous example, which is a simple example. Let me execute it first. So I do not have my web server running. So let me open this test folder and let me ensure that I'm running the web server on top of this one. So I have my web server running. So let me test this particular uh, web page that is currently my web server is running on 8080 and I am going to have t01.html and this is what I have and let me see all the network traffic what is going on here so let me see what I have in here okay so now you can see I have 10 and 20 which are being actually put as part of A and B as part of the scope here so you can see I have 10 and 20 which are being used here. So you can see A which is actually serving 10 and B serving the same value 20. And I also have an input box here which is bound to A and another input box which is bound to B. So essentially whatever the value you see in here A will also be shown here. And this is a two-way binding. You can see whatever the value you have in here will always be sent back to the scope. So if you do not uh, have any understanding about this one way or two way binding please refer to my previous video okay and now if I type something like 7 you can see how the automatic bindings are happening and the moment I click on calculate you can see I have some being performed and there is no network activity performed here why because everything is happening at the client so which means at the browser so again whenever I say 70 and whenever I say 80 and click on calculate you can see it has served 150 so whatever the operation you do here all those operations are actually happening from the client but nothing or no communication is being sent to the server so if there is any communication happening from the client to the server you are going to see all of that as part of the network these are the developer tools which can be always brought forward by just pressing F12 so just press F12 so just again, if you are not familiar with this, just press F12 and if you are not into onto network, just click on network and you are going to see all the network activity here. For example, if I try to refresh this page, now you can see all the network activity happening here. But let me clear all the network activity and the moment I click on calculate, no network activity has been performed here. Okay, let us modify this. Imagine I would like to have this particular sum to be calculated by my particular web service. So which means I would like to have a web service to be developed in such a way that it is going to take 10 and 20 as part of query string and that particular query string needs to be evaluated by my web service, fetch those values, do some process that is nothing but calculate sum and return the value back to my client which is nothing but 30. So I would like to perform something of that sort. So in order to do that, I need to have the server development, that is a web service development to be done. I will start with ASP.NET Web API, but I will also try to achieve the same thing using Node.js as well. For now, let us start with ASP.NET Web API first. So I have Visual Studio 2015 installed on my machine. So let us see. Okay, so as part of this one, let me create a new project. And as part of this, I am going to go to web. And imagine I have ASP.NET web application. So in this case, I am going to say something like uh, sample web API. So you can put whatever the name you wanted. 
and I just wanted to say sample web API here click OK and I'm going to select empty and I'm going to say I need only web API and nothing else and I just wanted to make sure that this is removed why because I'm not going to host on Azure so I just remove this I just select web API make sure that empty is selected for now just click OK okay so now that I have my particular web API here now you can see I have the controllers models and all that good stuff so I also have the global.ascx and so on so let me start with the controller I go to add controller and in this case I am going to select web API to controller click add and I am going to call the controller as uh, calculations controller and I click on add and now you can see I have calculations controller which is working under API controller so which means it is inheriting on API controller and now all I would like to have is I would like to have A and B which will be available as part of query string to be actually gathered here and calculate uh, the sum of the, those two. So for that purpose I'm going to have an action method which actually returns I HTTP action result and I'm going to say get sum is going to be the method which gets executed and it is going to accept two variables A and B which are nothing but the ones which you are going to pass as part of your query string and all I'm going to say is return an OK response so which means um, that is uh, it is a HTTP success so like a 200 HTTP uh, status code with the 200 will be returned as part of this OK and now along with the OK I would like to have a result called A plus B to be returned and in order to get to this particular action I would like to say the route is just simply sum so which means I am going to say something like uh, my domain slash sum slash provide whatever the query string and it has to return that particular value back so let me see if this is working first so I just execute this I'm just trying to keep this one simple and our, our concentration is not about API or uh, web API explanations here I just wanted to see that a web service is made available and we are trying to access it from AngularJS So this is going to give you an error why because we do not have any home page at the moment however we are going to have something like sum so that is the one we are going to work with and as part of this uh, we are also going to have the query string to be provided something like a equal to 40 and b equal to 50 something of that sort so I provide localhost 2267 sum is my route provide my particular query string and just press enter and now you can see it has currently returned the value in the form of XML which is nothing but 90 so you can also provide something like uh, 50 for example press enter and you know that it is actually returning the value of 100 so this is in the form of XML at the moment but you can also test this particular web service using uh, postman or whatever so let me open postman so I have installed postman on my particular uh, I mean as part of the add-ons available on the Chrome so I click on postman here okay so what is the URL here so I have this URL so let me use the same URL here and the moment I click on send you can see I, re I have 100 returned back so this is pretty important in this case I do not have XML even if you go to the raw mode I do not have any XML it just returned a plain value called 100 but in the case of uh, what I say executing straight from my particular browser it actually returned XML so it all depends on what kind of headers you are going to pass in this case postman was expecting JSON based result and that was the reason we just return it just returned only the value but in this case it this one actually tries to accept XML and that is how it has returned XML so ASP.NET web API is capable of serving both 
XML and JSON at the same time for those particular requests. So the response could be either in the form of XML or JSON depending upon the necessity. Anyway, so once we have our particular simple ASP.NET Web API achieved, we need to make sure that it is course enabled. That is the first thing we'll have to do if we did not. As I mentioned, course means I would like to have this particular sample web API website to be accessible from any, any domain. For that purpose, I need to enable course. So in order to do that, you have to open web API config and at the very top, you have to start with course, but prior to that, you have to install course related NuGet packages. So right click here and go to manage NuGet packages. And uh, in the search, just so go in here, search for that. And we got the first one, just select it and click install. And once I have that one installed, I save this. Let me close everything and let us quickly see what the packages has. So now you should see microsoft.asp.net.course is already made available and you can also see webapi.course is also made available. So now let us switch back to our web API config and now include the course enabling part. So the first thing is that we should say course equal to new enable course attribute and I'm going to say let me have the intelligence to have the importing of all those libraries so I have this one so let me again start with and now you can say I would like to have all origins all headers and all methods to be made available for that purpose I'm going to say star so star or asterisk means all so I'm going to say all origins and all headers and all methods so which means get post uh, put or all of those methods to be made accessible. So this is the instance of the course and next I will have to say please enable course using my particular specifications whatever I put in place. So this is important and if you would like to actually debug your particular Visual Studio along with course and everything there are a couple more things you will have to do. Usually the whatever I'm going to do now that is I'm going to add something like a uh, few more things like constraints I have to add a couple more constraints HTTP method equal and I will have to say HTTP method at options let me check what I have in here yeah, I need to have this guy. I think for I misspelled here. Okay. So after that, now I have to say config dot routes dot ignore route, and I have to say all the options, and at the same time, star path info constraints. So these two statements are not essential but these two statements are essential if and only if you are trying to debug your particular web API application as part of Visual Studio and as part of the web server initiated by the Visual Studio. If you are actually uh, creating or deploying this particular web service directly in the IIS itself you do not need these two statements. So you do not need these two statements if you are directly executing or deployed this one directly using IIS or IIS Express. However, if Visual Studio actually tries to deploy this using IIS Express from within Visual Studio and if you are trying to debug this for some reason it won't allow, in, it won't allow the cars even though you ask it to enable it. I don't know if that is a bug or not, but in order to make that one possible, I need to add these two statements. But for now, I'm just making sure that it really works the way it is supposed to be. Or probably, as I'm going to debug from Visual Studio, I would like to open these two as well. 
and see if that is going to work. Okay, so now that I have my particular web API which is enabled with cars, now I am ready to switch back to my particular AngularJS to actually talk to my web API. So whenever I execute this particular uh, web API, let me see. So my web API is currently hosted on 2267. This is important. So it is localhost 2267. So using 2267, you can provide anything and it is going to give you the result. So I am hosting my particular uh, web API in IS Express initiated by Visual Studio and that is available or made available at this port number that is 2267. Okay, let me switch back to my particular AngularJS and earlier I was doing the sum calculation right here as part of my client that is as part of the browser itself. Now I would like to have that one to be performed from the server so which means now I am going to work with $HTTP. So in order to work with $HTTP as you can see this is a service just like a dollar scope. I need to have that one to be also added here. So in this case I am going to work with $HTTP and I am also going to say something like I need to have $HTTP also to be provided in order to use it here. So now I am going to say $HTTP provide whatever of the options you would like to provide here dot then and as part of then I would like to have two functions to be provided. One is for success, the other is for failure. So as I mentioned in my previous presentation, I need to have all of this. So here I am going to have all the options to be provided and as part of this one, this is the success function and this one is failure function. So I have two functions there. So let me just make it understandable. So this is success function and this is failure function. That is a callback functions basically. Those two are the callback functions. So in this case I need to provide the options. So options is first of all I would like to say to which URL it needs to connect to. So in this case I am going to say it needs to connect to HTTP localhost and that is 2267 is my port number. So let me go through 2267 and my URL is sum and at the same time I need to provide the value of A to be whatever I am receiving from $scope.A. So whatever the value I get from A needs to be made available here and at the same time I am going to have one more that is B to be also provided with whatever I have from $scope.B. So this is pretty much what I will be having as part of the URL itself. And I would also like to provide the method. So in this case what HTTP method you would like to use in order to request from the server. In this case I would like to use get operation as because I am not really posting any information. It is just a get request where I just provide the URL and I am expecting a response back. So that URL includes my data as well. So it is like a get request. So I can provide the URL, what kind of HTTP method and once that particular response is made, I am going to have that particular response to be having a property called data. So this particular object, whatever you are going to write, say O or R or whatever, whatever you are going to say this one. So that particular object, whatever you are going to receive from the server, will have a special property called data. And that data will have whatever the data or whatever the response the server has sent back to the client. So in this case, all I am receiving is just the value that is 30 in this case why because I have 10 and 20 the response is going to be 30 and that is going to be available as part of response.data. So in order to have this particular data to be used all I am going to say is $.sum equal to response.data. Earlier you can see I am using $.scope.sum here. Similarly I am using the same variable sum here. However instead of calculating that locally that is as part of the web browser I am actually getting the response from the server and whatever the data or whatever the response I received from the server will be assigned to that particular member sum and which is made available as part of scope. 
and as this sum is available as part of scope you can see whatever the sum I am actually trying to evaluate goes with the same, same scope and you are going to have the value to be responded back so let me refresh this uh, using my particular HTTP localhost and here my particular AngularJS application runs under 8080 and it has got 201.html so this is important you can see I have IIS Express which is serving localhost 8080 why because you can see I have my particular test where is my test so you can see I'm actually serving my test like T01 I'm T01 HTML and T01 JS using 8080.t01 however my particular API web API is being served through 2267 so we have two different domains even though the ports are different so ports are different means you are actually trying to access from two different domains so the first domain is from 8080 for which I have the value here let me open Chrome instead of this one so that will have a better idea on what I'm trying to accomplish okay now you can see I'm actually trying to serve from 8080 let me open the network requests as well so I'm on network currently all the network is free and I'm trying to calculate something and now you can see I have 30 here okay so looks like I did not save something here let me save this I have this and I have this one as well so let me refresh this again clear everything so let me calculate this and now you can see I have 30 and you can see the network request has gone through so now you can see if I click on that the headers you can see it is a get request and you can also see how the URL has been performed by with the values whatever I have in place and in return it is a OK result which is having a 200 HTTP status code and as part of query string you can see 10 and 20 are the values which are being sent which are nothing but these two and as part of the response you can see I received 30 which is injected into the scope and that particular evaluation expression is based on the current scope which is having the value 30 so let me do one more modification I would like to have 75 and say 65 and click on calculate and now you can see again that particular 75 and 65 are being executed with new request to my 2267 which is nothing but the port number where my particular uh, Visual Studio is working here and once that is in place now you can see the response is 140 which is being made available here so this is pretty important and now imagine I'm going to start stop my particular web service and I also want to stop my um, 2667 port and imagine I am trying to again calculate this and whenever it is trying to do this now you can see it is given an error why because I stopped my particular web server of my web API and it says error connection refused okay so now that we have AngularJS talking to my particular web API let us dig a bit more depth here so I would like to include a debugger here and I would also like to include a debugger here so instead of debugger in this case I am going to say something like alert error occurred so this will be a better option if you would like to say so in this case again I go back to my application and the moment I click on calculate you can see my web server is not yet ready and you can see the alert comes up so even though you have your particular network off or say if you have developer tools completely switched off the moment you click on calculate if it throws an error it is going to give that particular message which is error record and that is going to be executed as because this is failure function the failure function gets executed if there exists no successful Ajax request and in this case this is successful if it is success I'm going to have some to be made available so the moment I say debugger I can have the luxury of debugging it as part of my developer tools so let me clear all the requests and let me execute my particular application and serve it through Visual Studio and make it available here 
and again let me refresh this of course I do not need to refresh this anyway I click on calculate and now you can see the request has been made if you can see the network it has already done the request and now if you return back you can see it has stopped right at the debugger and if you see this response you can see that particular response is having a property called data I'm actually trying to access this particular data right here response the data that is the that is the one which has got that particular value called 30 and you can also see it has got other information like status which is 200 which is nothing but a success HTTP code similarly status text as ok or whatever all these are automatically populated by AngularJS and whatever the response you receive from the server will be always put inside data and we are just using data for now okay now that we have done something using our particular ASP.NET web API we should also try to accomplish using Node.js so uh, that is for those particular developers who are more comfortable with uh, Node.js but not with ASP.NET web API so let us jump into my particular uh, topic of Node.js let me stop everything uh, let me close this Visual Studio as well and I also wanted to make sure that all the IIS and everything is gone okay so let me refresh this so you can see all the IIS and everything is gone so let me close everything okay so I just wanted to keep this one like this however I would like to start some kind of development from my particular uh, folder so that is in this case I would like to call this one as node API you can put any folder and you can see as part of node API let me start there so I go to node API so right now it has got nothing so let me open my command prompt here where is my command prompt right here so the first thing is that I need to initiate this one as a node application so let me start as an app so I'm going to call npm init So just press S, S, S for now. And now you can see the moment I say that it has created my package.json. And now there are a couple of things I would need to do before even say th saying that, you know, it is made available as part of Node.js. So the first thing is that I need to work with Express.js in this case. So I would like to say, uh, let me click on npm install express now you can say I'm installing the node package called express and similarly I would like to install the other one called course why because I need to enable the course for this one too so there is one more package called course so I installed both of those two so now that we have both of those two the next thing is that just create a new file so let me make sure that both of those two are installed so both of the store installed so let me create a new file here and I call this one as app.js and now you can see I created app.js and as part of this one the first thing is that I need to ensure that express is included and similarly course is also included and the next thing is that I need to create an express application and I wanted to make sure that that particular express application is enabled with cores and now I need to have a router just like the router you have in the ASP.NET Web API so I can say router here and as part of this router I can say I would like to work with some router and as part of this particular some router I am going to have request and response to be made available here and whenever this particular router gets hit the request contains all the data and whatever the, whatever the data I would like to send back as a response I will be using this response object so I am going to say please get from the request object from the query string get the value of A Sim similarly similarly variable B will have the value from the query string parameter called B so once I have both in place I would like to have a value C to be calculated which essentially turns A to integer 
and adds that one to an integer value of b. So now that I have c, all I have to say is to the response, make sure that the status is 200, which means it is successful. And at the same time, the value of what I'm going to send is in the form of JSON. And in this case, the value 30, say, whatever the sum you got in here will be returned in the form of JSON with an HTTP code 200, which is nothing but success. So I have that in place. And now I'm going to say use a router for my particular application and I would like to say my particular application has to listen at some port number so in this case I would like to say 4467 you can you can put anything so once that particular server starts listening I would like to say something like console.log started listening at 4467 so just to info, uh, provide some information to the user. So this is the simplest, um, what I say, web API, what I could write using Node.js. But it honored, in order to execute it, I need to have a particular web server running exclusively for this one. Uh, no, not even the web server, just execute this particular app.js. So I need to jump in here. And I am going to say something like node app.js, or just say app in this case. Okay, there is an error somewhere so that is function okay let me see. oh there is a spelling mistake here that is I okay so let me jump back let me execute this and now you can see it has started listening 4467 so let me get back to my postman so instead of 4467 I would like to use 4467 now instead of 2267 I would like to use 4467 so just press send and now you can see I have 100 here. Why? Because I have 50 and 50. So similarly, if I send 30, I click send. Now you can see I have 50 here. So which means my particular uh, web server is running as part of my Node.js. So let me switch back to my AngularJS. So where is my thing? So this is my code. Earlier, it was actually going to 2267. So I'm going to say, please switch to 4467 and open my particular uh, browser and use 8080t01.html oh i need to i need to have my web server running on this one so run my is here and now you can see it is executed and now i have this let me open my network tools before even clicking on sum i click on sum now and now you can see i got the value as 30 why? Because I'm still debugging it. So if you go to the network, you are going to see sum is being performed, but instead it is talking to 4467 instead of 2267. So in that way, you can say I developed two different types of web services. One is using ASP.NET Web API. The other one is using Node.js. But we are able to access both of those two web services right using AngularJS. But in order to execute that, I mentioned that we are actually trying to enable the course as part of those two web applications, whatever I developed using ASP.NET Web API or Node.js. That is important. And I just wanted to explain one more thing. This is not a typical way of developing uh, AngularJS code. Like the controllers are supposed to be as light as possible. We are not supposed to do any kind of AJAX based operations right inside the controller. We should do it in somewhat different way. But this is just to explain AJAX, but not really go with the standards. So in order to go with the standards and where the AJAX-based communications can happen, we should really do that as part of uh, custom service, which I'm going to cover in my next topic anyway. But for now, let us consider this is the simplest way to get everything working. However, in order to go with standards, this code should not be available as part of controller. Just a quick heads up. That's not going to be a good practice though. Okay, so now that we have some understanding on dollar $HTTP, let us see on how we can use, uh, what I say, dollar $log as well. So imagine if everything is successful here, probably you would like to use dollar $log. As I mentioned, just like dollar $HTTP, dollar $log is also a service from built-in AngularJS. So in order to use that, I can say dollar $log and dollar log 
and now you are free to use dollar log here so whenever you would like to write something like console.log you are trying to use those particular logging mechanisms available as part of your development tools right inside the browser so instead of using console.log when you are developing angular js js based code it is always recommended to use dollar log and it is it knows how to work with console.log or console behind the scenes but moving forward make sure that if you are developing angular js instead of using console.log you should use dollar dot sorry dollar log dot so in this case i can say response.data and if i have any error probably i can instead of alerting it probably i can say dollar dot uh, I can also say error so I can also say something like error occurred or whatever so so other methods which are available as part of dollar log are something like this you have debug error info warning and all of that good stuff so most of the time for the tracing you can use log for debugging you can use debug and for error we know that whenever error occurs and info especially if you would like to have some kind of heads up for the user and one if something is going to happen something bad you are just warning so you can use any of those particular methods but for now if I use something like this imagine I am refreshing this and um, I'm calculating this and now you can see it actually writes right inside the console so if you switch off this one you know it doesn't really matter on how much or how many you are clicking here why because that will not be made available as part of your web page but if you open your network tools sorry your developer tools you are going to see that information as part of your console so dollar log is going to be pretty much uh, helpful if you are going to develop more and more services over the time okay so that uh, actually covers what are all I would like to cover as part of my Ajax introduction for AngularJS. So as part of this video, we actually communicated with ASP.NET Web API or Node.js based web services from AngularJS using $HTTP. <laughs>